2 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. Friday, the Lord just began to open the story up to me. And I want to feel like it's a word from the Lord for somebody. And the king of Assyria, 2 Kings 18, verse 17. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rapsaris. I just wish they would have been Billy and Bob and Joe. And, <laughs> and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. Verse number 19. And Rab Shekeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria. What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? He's talking down to the people of God. We're going to come back and, and fill in some of these blanks later. Skip down to verse 27. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung? And let's tone it down a little bit. And drink their own urine with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Then he begins to give more derogatory words to Hezekiah. Skip down to verse 37. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rab Shekeh. And that phrase jumped out at me this week, and told him the words of Rab Shekeh. To my knowledge, and I've read the Bible through many times, but for whatever reason, Rab Shekeh has never stuck out to me until this week. So I know that I've read his name, but I just never understood his intention. So I want to preach for a few minutes tonight on this thought, the words of Rab Shekeh. The words of Rab Shekeh. If you're going to help me preach, shout amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Now, I know you know this, so just by a little reminder, I want to do that and remind you that there are certain things that we would call spiritual strongholds. A stronghold is, is simply defined as a place that has been fortified to protect against attack. Strongholds. The enemy has established certain strongholds throughout the world. There are some cities who have strongholds that other cities do not have. It doesn't mean that it is necessarily easier in another city. It just means that city doesn't fight that devil. For example, I would think, and I've never pastored there. I've only been there once. Uh, I don't know that I'll ever go back. And I'm not saying you, you shouldn't or you couldn't. But I would think that there are different devils for our churches in Las Vegas than what maybe they fight in Leesville, where I'm from. I would just think that there would be a stronghold there of certain things that may not be somewhere else. When Jesus went and the man that was in the tombs that had 2,000 demons in him, and uh, he, he, he began to bargain with the Lord. He said, don't cast me away from the region." I'm okay leaving this body, but put me in something else. 
so I don't have to leave this region because for whatever it was, there was a stronghold that he was operating in in that particular region. And then we'll bring it even a little closer to home. There are some families who suffer from strongholds that other families don't suffer from. Some of you wonder why you have perverted thoughts in your mind out of nowhere. Let me just give you a little insight. If you were to do, go to, what do they call that, uh, uh, 21 and Me or the, all the websites that you can now find out that you thought you were an American, you're really something else and all that stuff, Ancestry. If you were to do, follow your family tree, I promise you somewhere somebody in your family tree struggled with that and never got victory from it. And the Bible, I don't want to spook you out, but the Bible speaks very clearly that some sins are, brought, are carried on from one generation to another generation. So there are some families that are struggling with certain strongholds that, that other people may not struggle from. It doesn't mean you don't have your struggles. but So it, it becomes very hard if we were to begin to judge and we begin to uh, critique the pastor in such and such city that's fighting a stronghold we know nothing about. It would be very, very immature of us to say, well, he must not be really living for God or he could build a church in that city. That's very childish of us to speak about things that we know not of. And it also becomes very childish when we look at people in the church and go, well, I don't know why they're still struggling with that, and I don't know why they're still putting up with that. They've been in church three weeks, my Lord. You think if they'd have got the same Holy Ghost I'd have got... But there are strongholds, a place that has been fortified. And, and the key word there is fortified. It means to strengthen, and it means to protect, and it means to reinforce. And so the devil has these strongholds that he works and operates, and his desire is to make sure that he is constantly securing them and resecuring them and reinforcing them, and he's making sure that they remain strong so it'll keep people tied up in their sins. Now, the only thing that is, uh, that is stronger than a stronghold this is going to get deep, is a greater stronghold. The only thing that a stronghold fears the most is a stronghold that's stronger and that's greater than it is. And I may preach more on this in a moment, but I'll just kind of let the cat out of the bags. That's what happened when I, when I don't have a lot of notes typed out just right. But the church is a stronger stronghold than any other stronghold in the world. Let me say that to this side of the church because I don't think they heard it. The church is a stronger stronghold than any stronghold in the world. That's why the devil fears a truth-preaching church because it's going to do damage to his stronghold. So don't walk out of here and say, well, Brother Tony's saying that, that the enemy's not strong. I'm not remotely saying that. But I am saying that the enemy is strong. But God, <laughs> ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that in you than he that's in the world. It doesn't say that he that's in the world isn't great. He just says, I've weighed it out. And he that's in you is greater. Quit giving the devil excuses. Quit giving the devil ammunition. Quit giving the devil glory. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I know the devil is great, but God is greater. I know the spirit of the Antichrist is strong, but God is stronger. Somebody clap your hands and give him praise. That's why the Bible says in Luke chapter number 11 and verse 21, it says, when a strong man, everybody says strong man. So we're not saying there's not a stronghold in Gainesville. We're not saying the devil doesn't work out. 
We're not saying the devil isn't strong. I'm not saying that what you're going through isn't a big, bad issue. But verse 21 says, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all the armor wherein he trusted, and he divided his spoil. A principle is being taught here. That as long as the stronghold remains intact, the enemy's controls until something stronger shows up. I just want to say this. The stronghold in this city has been operating long enough. It's time we introduce him and it to something stronger. Let me introduce you to the stronger man, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is stronger than your issue. He is stronger than your sickness. He is stronger than your addiction. He is stronger than a generational curse. He is stronger than a bankruptcy. He is stronger than a divorce. He is stronger than mistakes. He is stronger than, a, than anything that may have you tangled up. He is a great and strong God. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was a bad place. Bad place. I mean, you talk about a stronghold. Woo! It was such a stronghold that angels couldn't show up without the perversion trying to get on the angels. It was such a stronghold that that Lot decided that he would give his virgin daughters to the wicked men of the city in, in an order of trying to compromise or make something happen. You talk about messed up. It was a stronghold. Somebody shout, a stronghold. But all God said he needed was just ten righteous people. And he said, I would spare it if you can find 10. I don't need a mega church in Sodom. I don't need a huge church in Sodom. I just need a storefront on Main Street somewhere that's got about 10 people in it that's trying to live for God. And God is saying that, that those 10 people is a greater stronghold than the stronghold of perversion that had a hold of that church. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I see more than ten here tonight, which means that this becomes the greater stronghold than any perversion, any problem, any issue. Don't you dare let the devil make you think you're something, you're part of something small and insignificant. The devil is a lie. This is the church of the living God. This is the greatest thing we got going. This is more powerful than anything else in the world. You think the military's bad? Wait till you meet our God. Somebody shout amen. amen. And so... We've got the words of Rabshakeh. It's kind of like, it's kind of like maybe a, a veggie tale character. <laughs> words of Rabshakeh. So Hezekiah, the Bible teaches in 2 Kings chapter 18, Hezekiah was the king over Judah. He was the king of Judah. And the Bible says in, in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 2, or verse number three, it says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, now that phrase, that which was right, the, the words that which was is italicized, which means that they put those words in there to give it a better flow. Usually that works well. I personally like it without those italicized words in this particular case, because this is what it would say. And he did right. And he did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. First thing I want you to notice is he did right. You can never go wrong by doing right. 
he did right. The Bible says in verse number four, he removed the high places. He broke the images. He cut down the groves. He broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. Verse number five, he trusted in the Lord, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. When you do right, and when you start trying to clean up some things in your life, it doesn't matter if nobody else has ever done it before you, you can do it. And it doesn't matter if nobody ever does it after you, you can still do it. Verse number six, he claved to the Lord, departed not from following him, kept his commandments. Now I want you to catch, there's nine things that Hezekiah did that made him a success. He did right. He removed the high places. He broke the images. He cut down the groves. He broke the brazen serpent. He clave, he trusted in the Lord. He claved to the Lord. He departed not from the Lord. He kept his commandments. And when you do all of those things, then verse number seven is a no-brainer. And the Lord was with him. You can't do right and remain by yourself. And the Lord was with him. And he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria. Now that's going to come back and bite him in a minute. And served him not. Anytime you start doing right for the Lord. Anytime you start making a stand for righteousness. Anytime you start trying to pull down strongholds. Anytime you start trying to worship the one true God. You hear me. God will bless you. God will help you. But you will also fight enemies that you've never fought before. And you'll go through things that you've never gone through before. So I guess my question is tonight is are you ready for the fight? Either that or we can remain slaves and we can remain uh, held hostage and we can allow the stronghold to keep controlling or we can stand up and say, you know what, if God did it for Hezekiah, he can do it for me. If God did it for them, he can do it for us. If God did it back then, he can do it right now. Yeah, we may have to fight some devils, but my God has never lost a battle yet and he's not going to start losing one now. And so we're going to put our trust in the Lord. Let God be true. And every man a liar. Somebody shout amen. amen. So the Lord was with him. The Lord prospered him. He didn't serve the king of Assyria. Verse number eight, it gets better. He smote the Philistines. I mean, he, Hezekiah, and Judah. The preacher and Judah was taking care of business. You get me a preacher that's not afraid to do right, that's not afraid to remove the high places, that's not afraid to say we're worshiping junk we shouldn't be worshiping. You give me a preacher that trusts in the Lord, that, that, that will you know, grab a hold of the Lord. You give me a preacher that will keep his commandments. And then you add some people from Judah. You add some people that's not afraid to praise God. You add some people that's not afraid to worship God. You let Hezekiah, that preacher, get tangled up with some people from Judah that's not afraid. And I'm telling you, there's not a devil in hell that can stop us from doing what God has called us to do. You know what this city needs? This city needs a preacher and it needs some worshipers. This city needs a preacher and it needs some worshipers. And if we can, if we can mesh ourselves together, Judah can go before us and fight battles that we'll never have to fight. We can praise God tonight and God can fight battles for us that we would never ever have to fight on our own. And so all these great things are happening to Hezekiah. Let me say it like this. Listen, business success is never by accident. If you find somebody that God has blessed their business, and you find somebody that God is blessing their business, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you 99,000 times out of 99,001. Somebody that's working like a dog. Somebody that sacrifices. Somebody that has done without for a long time so their company can get off the ground. 
Success is never by accident. Neither is spiritual success. If you see somebody that the Lord is prospering and you see somebody that the Lord is, is, is favoring and you see somebody that the Lord is anointing, you can know one thing's for sure. That's not a lazy person spiritually. That person is trying his best to do what's right. He's trying to remove the high places. He's trying to live for God. Listen to me. Hezekiah wasn't just lucky. He wasn't just, you know, in the right place at the right time. He was righteous, and he was doing the right things all the times. I want to preach today and tell you that we've got to get to the place where we live for God in the good times and the bad times. Where we live for God when things are great, when things are not so great. We don't have time to live defeated lives. Where we only pray when things are bad. Or we only pray when there's sickness in the family. Or we only pray when there's no money. Or we only pray. No, God's tired of that spare tire mentality. He's looking for somebody that will say, I'm going to trust you, God, with everything I've got. we got to be intentional. We've got to be resolute. we got to be on purpose. God didn't die so we could occasionally live for him when we want to. Uh, He died so we would give him all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our minds. God will never anoint lukewarmness. God will never anoint lazy. God will never anoint a lethargic attitude. But God will always bless and make a way for somebody who is sold out to the Lord. Somebody shout amen. amen. Let's just look here. Second Kings chapter number 18. And it came to pass in the fourth year. Uh, king Hezekiah serving. And, and then the king of Assyria. The one he said he would never serve. He starts advancing. And he besieged Samaria. And at the end of three years they took it. Verse 10. Verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel. Unto Assyria. And put them. It, it, by the river in, in the city of Medes because, listen to me, they obeyed not the voice of the Lord but transgressed his covenant. When you don't obey God, you're setting yourself up to be kidnapped by the devil. When you don't obey the voice of the Lord, you're setting yourself up to go through things that you never had to go through. When you don't obey the voice of the Lord, you're setting yourself up to pray prayers that you should have never had to pray. And the Bible says that, and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded them and would not hear them nor do them. I highlighted that in my Bible because doing is always connected to hearing. That's why the voice of a preacher is so important in our lives. Because we have to hear how can they be saved without a preacher. Amen. You cannot do what you don't hear. That's why we got to have preaching. And so now we're in the 14th year. And the king of Assyria comes up and he begins to attack Judah, the fenced city of Judah. And he began to take them. Now Hezekiah gets probably a little concerned here. And Hezekiah, he tries to, uh, he tries to make a deal with the devil. In verse number 9, the king of Assyria begins to, to advance. He begins to keep pushing forward and he begins to destroy and he begins to conquer. And then Hezekiah begins to try to make deals with the enemy. And Hezekiah is going to, he's going to like, okay, let's look at this. Let's see what Hezekiah said. And Hezekiah, uh, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish saying, I have offended, return for me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria pointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's real Confusing language in the King James to just say, what do I got to do to pay you off? What do I got to do to give you to get you away from my family and to get you away from my people? And, and Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house, but that couldn't pay it. And so Hezekiah had to cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars uh, that had been overlaid. So he had to strip the building clean to try to pay a debt to an enemy that's not going to be satisfied with that payment. That's why compromise is so deadly. Because once the devil realizes that you'll pay, then he'll just up the ante. So the best thing you can do from the very beginning is draw a line and say, I'm not stepping over that line. 
as the old timers would say, come hell or high water. I'm not stepping over that line. I'm not going to make deals with the devil. Some of you are here tonight and you've lost stuff you should have never lost. You've been stripped of things you should have never been stripped of. It's because in a moment of weakness, you got so tired of the enemy advancing on you and your family that you said, okay, what if I give you this? Would that satisfy you? And, and if I promised to give you this, would you back up? And, and the enemy always says yes. But here's what you need to know about the devil. He's a liar. Now, I don't want to be too bold, but you can't trust a liar. It's bad to have the reputation that if your mouth is moving, you're lying. It's just hard, it's just hard to get in business with somebody like that. Well, here's the deal about the devil. If his mouth's moving, he's lying. And so Hezekiah said, okay, I'm going I'm I'm to give you all this. And now I want, you to, I want you to take it. And now I want you to leave us alone. So Hezekiah gives him all the silver. Gives them all the gold. But did that appease the enemy? Oh, no. No. Now he's just got no money. And he's got a house of God that's been stripped. And here comes the devil again. And now the king of Assyria, verse 17, sent Tartan and Robaceras and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah. And they went up and he begins to talk to them. And now he begins to taunt him a little bit. Look at verse number 19. <laughs> verse number 19, he said, Say to, the, to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria. Anytime the enemy starts talking to us and he knows that we've already compromised once, he starts elevating the other king to put fear in your heart. That's really where I'm coming at tonight. I'm coming at that some of you are not doing what God is telling you to do and you're making deals with the devil because you've got fear in your heart. And he, so he elevates, oh, the great king of Assyria, this big stronghold, we're advancing, we're taking over. And, and then he begins to talk down to the man of God. What confidence, verse 19, is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, oh, but they're just vain words. That you have counsel and you have strength for war, but whom dost thou trust? Now behold, O Rabshakeh says, if you trust in Egypt, well, that's foolish. He said, because Egypt is going to surrender and come under us. And he said, but if you say unto me, verse 22, that, that we trust in the Lord our God. <laughs> he said, will you not say that the Lord, that you've taken down all the high places? Because see, the enemy doesn't understand worship. Any altar is not an altar for the Lord. That, that was their problem in the book of Acts. They had all these altars, and then they just had one to the unknown God, just in case we missed one. And, and so Hezekiah began to take down all this other crazy worship, and he said, let's just worship at Jerusalem. Let's just worship the one true God of Israel. But, 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 but oh, Rabshakeh, he didn't understand that. And he said, so if you're saying you're trusting in God, well, you speak vain words. Look at verse number 20. He says, you say you have counsel and strength for war, but you speak vain words. In other words, the enemy wants to know there, where do you get your strength? The, the devil has always been attracted to the strong. Let me say that again. The devil has always been attracted to the strong. That's why if the devil isn't attacking you before you get all puffed up with pride and arrogance, you might want to stop and think that he may not be attacking you because he doesn't even think you're strong enough to worry about. But if you're constantly going through this and you're going through that, that, might in, that enemy might be intrigued by your strength and that attack needs to be the barometer for what you really bring to the table or else the devil would leave you be. But because he wants to know, where do you get your strength? The devil couldn't understand the strength of Job. Where does he get his strength? 
to keep worshiping God like that. The devil couldn't understand the strength of Samson. Where does he get his strength? I'm telling you, Samson was not some muscle-bound man. Samson looked like me. Because if I'm killing thousands of people and I'm jerking iron gates off of walls and I'm all Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're not going to say, where do you get your strength? But when God uses somebody normal to do supernatural things, the devil scratches his head and goes, where does he get that strength? And he's never happy until he can rob you from the source where you get your strength. And right now, the reason why the devil is attacking some of you is because he wants to know, where do you get your strength? You've been going through hell, but you're still clapping your hands and you're still praising God. You've had to bury loved ones, but you're still in church. Where's where does that strength come from? That's why you're being attacked. He wants to take away your strength. He wants to take away your source. And he said, hey, we've already, you've already ripped down all these, all these altars here. That's what verse 21, verse 22 is saying. So listen to me. The words of Rabshakeh always wants to put fear in your heart. Wants to make you think you've missed it. The words of Rabshakeh always wants to minimize worship. Well, you can't, com can't have confidence in God. There's no altars here. In verse number 23, look at this. Now remember, he done gave them all the silver. He done stripped the gold off the doors. In verse 23, he says, Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria. Give us more money. And then verse number 31 Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Israel, make an agreement with me by a present. In other words, give me more. How many of you realize that the devil is never satisfied? He's not going to be happy if he's got your kids. He wants you. He's not going to be happy if he's got you. He wants a person on the pew with you. And if the church doesn't stand up and say, wait a minute, we've got to stop making these stupid deals with the devil. We got to quit compromising. We can't just give him. Okay, let me just give the Lord a couple of hours a week and then I'll give the devil all this other time. We will go spiritually bankrupt tomorrow. Somebody's got to stand up and put their feet down and grab a hold of the horns of the altar and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I know we may not, we may have compromised last year and we may have made a stupid deal last month, but that's got to stop because the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And then, let's just, is this all right? Now look at verse 32. He said, verse 31, he said, let's give me more money. And then he says this, I will come and take you away to a land like unto your own land. A land of corn and wine, a land of bread, and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. Now, if you, if you look beyond all the little fancy wording there, this is what he's saying. We're going to take your land, and we're going to take you somewhere else where you're going to become a slave. But the devil never says that. He always promises you more on the other side. Because the Lord had already said, I'll give you a land flowing with milk and honey. But now look what the enemy's trying to do. Well, I'll give you a land. Okay, if the Lord's giving you a land of milk and honey, okay, then I'll give you a land of uh, corn and wine. And I'll give you a land of bread and vineyards and olive and honey. But what he's not telling you, oh, you'll be a slave. Your kids will marry pagans. You will not be able to worship God. But you'll have more on this side than what God's promised you on that side. Now, it's easy for us to nod our head in church and go, yeah, that makes sense. But there's people that are not here tonight because they have bought the lie of the enemy. <laughs> and he wants more. He says, okay, I'm going to give you more. I'm going to give you this. I'm gonna give, you're going to have more than you had with God. The devil is never satisfied. 
with what you give him. He always wants more. The words of Rabshakeh, verse number 25. Let's go back and look at that. He said, am I now come up with, without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The, listen what Rabshakeh is saying. The Lord said to me, go up to this land and destroy it. So he's standing there saying, the Lord sent me. The words of Rabshakeh always, always uses the Lord as his prop. The Lord sent me. The Lord sent me. The Lord's behind this. Verse number 26, I'm not going to read it all, but, but Eliakim said, hey, you, you're speaking the Syrian language. He said, only speak that language. Do not speak the language of the Jews because I don't want the Jews to hear what else you're saying. But, oh, Rabshakeh, he can talk that language too. Let me tell you something tonight. The devil can talk your language. He knows exactly what to say to get you. He talks your language. He knows how to speak your language. He knows your shortcomings. He knows your areas of weakness. And then, look at verse 29. He said, let not Hezekiah deceive you. For he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Now he's attacking the man of God. That's the words of Rabshakeh. Always wants to minimize the preacher's voice. Verse 30, neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand. In other words, don't believe all that positive preaching when he gets up there saying the Lord's going to fight for us. The Lord's going to deliver you. He's trying to drive a wedge between them and the man of God. And that's what's happening right now with some folks in this church. The devil, the words of Rabshakeh, are there, he's trying his best to tell you, you don't have to listen to that man. He's young, but he's old-fashioned. You don't have to listen to him. Brother Arnold didn't vet him enough. You don't have to listen to him. You don't have to worry about that. He'll, he'll, he'll change. He'll change. You, just, you, don't, you don't worry about that. You, you, just, you, you don't worry about this. You, you, you don't worry about that. And the enemy is constantly trying to attack and the enemy is constantly promising more than you've got now. Well, I know you don't have this, but now if you'll come with me, I'll give you a land flowing with this and this and this and this. And he's always trying to promise more. And he's always trying to get us to, to, to question the man of God. Don't you start believing that preacher when he says God can heal you. And don't you start believing that preacher when he says that God is for you. And don't you believe that preacher when he says, who, who can stand against the king of Assyria? That's what he's saying there. Listen to me. There's a rapshakeh in every city. There is a rapshakeh in every church. And there is that voice and those words that's trying to get in every home of every believer where the devil is promising more than what you that you can have more than what you have now and he wants to make us doubt the pastor don't listen to him God can't can't do what he's saying he can't give you the kind of revival that he's preaching he's too old-fashioned you don't have to listen to him you don't have to live by those standards but I've come to tell you tonight we've listened to the words of Rabshakeh long enough it's time to flip the page it's time to flip the page because I'm about to introduce you to the words of Isaiah and Isaiah is going to put Rabshakeh in his place and God is going to show up and do what he promised he would do and so some of you have just been listening and the devil whatever whatever avenue or vehicle he's been using he's just been trying to tell you this and all of a sudden now they rent their clothes they, that, when you rent your clothes in the Bible that was the ultimate that was the ultimate sign of defeat you don't know what to do. You're depressed. You rent your clothes. Some of you have been ripping clothes off not physically and if you have stop that too but spiritually <laughs> just, just thought I'd throw that in there just to shut up Rabshakeh while I'm there. But spiritually, you've rent your garments. God, I don't know what to do. I'm depressed. I don't know how I'm going to do this. They rent their garments because of the words of Rabshakeh. That's exactly where the devil wants to get us. He wants to get us to the place where we don't think there's any hope, where we don't, we don't think that it can ever get better, and we can't break this cycle. And 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 3, when they came to Hezekiah, and when he heard it, he rent his clothes. So now the people are depressed, and the preacher's depressed. Dear God, don't ever let the pew and the pulpit get depressed at the same time. 
in verse 3, and Hezekiah said, This is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy. For the children are come to give birth and there's no strength to bring forth. They rent their clothes. They said, this is a day of rebuke. This is a day of blasphemy. That we're not going to be able to give birth. And that's exactly what the words of Ramshakeh always does. Makes you think that you can't give birth to what God said you can give birth to. And he's trying his best to depress you and get you to place that. We can't really do what God has called us to do. The stronghold is too strong. And the situation is too bad. And it's going to always put fear in our heart. And it's, we're never going to be able to do it. But you listen to me. Forever, Ramshakeh, there has to be an Isaiah. And verse number 6, And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words thou hast just heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Are you ready? Verse 7, Behold, the Lord said, I will send a blast upon him. And this is what I wrote down. The enemy's blaspheme is no match for God's blasting. The enemy's blasphemy is no match for God's blasting. And I looked up that word blast. What does that mean? I'll send a blast upon him. And the word blast there means spirit or wind. So when the words of Ramshakeh tells you that you can't do it, that God's not for you, that this thing's about to fall apart, you know what you need? Uh, you need to get in the presence of a spirit-filled church service. And you need the Lord to begin to blow. And you need the Lord, the wind of the Holy Ghost, begin to blow. Come on, you ought to clap your hands right now. You've listened to the blasphemous report from the enemy long enough. God says, I've got a blast for his blasphemy. I've got a moving of the Spirit for every lie that the enemy... You can be free. You can be set free. You can be delivered. You can walk away from that addiction. You can be healed. That's God breathing on us right now. You've listened to the words of Ramshakeh long enough. Let Isaiah speak into your life right now. See, when I don't have notes, I don't know how long I've been preaching. The devil's Blasphemy is no match for a moving of God's Spirit. No wonder the enemy doesn't want us to worship God. No wonder the enemy tries his best to get us from praising God. No wonder the enemy tries to get us focused on all the negative. Because all that doubt and unbelief. Wouldn't it be awesome if we left church tonight and on the way home, you just kind of looked over at your wife while you was driving home, and you said... Didn't we have a blast tonight? Wait, man, wasn't that? Whoosh. Didn't we have a blast tonight? What do you mean? Didn't God's spirit come in and begin to wipe away doubt? And un I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, some of you have been listening to words you shouldn't be listening to. Uh, but God says, be not afraid of those words. Uh, the devil is a liar and he's a father of all lies. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Come on, stand to your feet and clap your hands right now and give God praise. Come on, clap your hands and give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 He said, be not afraid. Of the words which thou hast heard. <laughs> and I love what Isaiah did. He didn't even call him by name. He did not even speak the name of Rabshakeh. He just said, which the servant of the king of Assyria has blasphemed me. The words of Rabshakeh will get us to the point to where we're so fearful. We're shaking. 
We're renting our clothes. We're battling thoughts we didn't think we'd ever battle. But God sent me here to tell somebody that's been listening to the wrong voice, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. Now remember, a stronghold is a fortified place. It's a fenced city. It's a place that's been reinforced. Now, 2 Kings chapter 18, I believe it was, in verse number 13 says that that Judah, yeah, there it is, that Judah was a fenced city. No wonder he wanted that city so much because that was the stronger hold. It was a fortified place. I know you think we Pentecostals are a little crazy and you just think we're very shallow, emotional people, but you're missing it by a million miles. Because when we begin to worship God, it's like a bricklayer building a wall. And that worship begins to build a wall. You know, we, we say that Jesus be a fence. That's Bible. What we're saying is, it's not like Jesus just be, be a little, you know, sometimes we put plants in front of stuff to hide it so you don't have to see the speaker, you know, and we try to make people think there's not a speaker there. And we put the, some of you got shrubs where Jesus wants a fence. And the devil just looks at that and moves that and that's not a big deal. And he just keeps attacking you because you have no stronger hold than the stronghold. But Judah was a fenced city. It was a fortified place. You hear me. Our praise and worship is a fenced place. It's a fortified place. And, and we're not, we're not going to try to roll in the floor tonight. As a matter of fact, we're going we're gonna to be a little more somber for the altar call. But when we begin to worship God, that's not just some display of, of some uneducated people that, that got caught up in the emotion. And if you remotely want to argue that with me, let me YouTube some sporting events that have some of the richest people in the world sitting at those places. So this has got nothing to do with our education level. This has got everything to do with what we're sold out to. And that's why the devil is doing everything in his power to send the words of Rapture K all into your life saying, Hey, God sent me here. That's a lie. You, you can always know if somebody's of God because if they're minimizing worship, they're not of God. If they minimize the man of God, they're not of God. If they start trying to plant doubts in your mind about what God is able to do in your life, they're not of God. And some of you have made deals with junk you should have never made deals with. I wish I could get your money back. You may never get it back, but you don't ever have to make another bad deal in your life. Maybe I ought to write a book called The, the Art of the Spiritual Deal. Didn't Donald Trump write a book called The Art of the Deal? Maybe I can write one, the art of the spiritual deal. Because you don't have to make stupid decisions and get your family spiritually molested and raped and stolen from. The enemy has advanced enough. It's time we quit listening to the words of the enemy. It's, some of you are here and it's got fear on your heart. And maybe this sermon's not for everybody, but I know it's for somebody. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to lift your hands up toward heaven. I just, I'm going to ask tonight, point blank. If fear has been trying to get a stronghold in your life, you're who I'm preaching to. If you've been listening to voices that you should not be listening to and they have been trying to manipulate you, I'm asking you tonight to please be not afraid of those voices. Those voices are not from God. The enemy's trying to trick you. And the Lord, I didn't get to it, but the Lord said he went ahead. He'll take care of that voice. He'll destroy that voice. He'll, he'll kill that person out. Amen. With your hands raised, I wonder tonight if fear has been trying to grip your heart. If doubt and unbelief has been trying to become the, the common denominator in your life. I wish you'd step out of your pew where you are and you'd come stand around this front. If you feel like a stronghold is too strong in your life and you need God to make you stronger, 
I wish you'd step out. If you've went through a valley or been through hell and you just need God to speak a word of hope to you, I've come to tell you we've listened to the words of the enemy long enough. Be not afraid of those words. Be not afraid of those words. Let God speak to you. Let God breathe upon you tonight. Let God help you tonight. As they begin to sing, let's talk to the Lord all over this place.